Good morning. Scott Shannon is here. Oh, with Mitchell Stewart. What's going on, morning, Scott? Guys. How are you, man? You. By the way, this is what an ass I am. I almost told Scott pull the mic closer, and I'm like, you gotta fucking <laughs> tell Scott how to talk into a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just came to thank Sam for everything he's ever done for my career. <laughs> <laughs> this guy beat the crap out of me. He just beat the holy shit out of me for years, and now that some one day he figured out it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was. Then he was on Team. He created Team Scott. Yeah, he's the one behind. Uh, what? There's a tree on your. There's a tree on my yes. house. And we never liked it, but Sam insisted. Yeah. I don't know what you guys are oh, talking. No, that wasn't me. Guy. That was a different. You're the same guy that did. Wait a minute. What was he? Oh. The Boat Movie. Yeah, oh, I forgot about the Boat Movie. <laughs> oh, I didn't. The Boat Movie. I would listen to that show, Scott. I have to tell you, and there would be moments where you would make a, a, a comment and just nobody in the room would acknowledge it, and I'd go, gold. gold. Yeah. This is exactly, exactly what I'm looking for. Because you can hear underlying tension. When, yeah, you, when you're in a situation that has underlying tension, you can hear it yeah, on other... Well, it, was, uh, it was weird because I had a contract, and I, uh, in a, you know, it was a good contract, but if I wanted to get out, I couldn't have gotten out. And, um, and it was obvious that the person I worked with wanted to be the whole enchilada. He didn't want me around there. So, and he would, uh, you know, drop little hints about, the, you know, the guy, well, are you still going to do this again? Yeah, I'm going to do it as long as I can do it. Yeah. I enjoy what I do. And uh, I, I like all, I could do any kind of radio. I would love to do, you know, anything. He would try to push you into retirement? Like, yeah. are you still going to, that's, yeah. That's always so transparent. When so, yeah. Like, Jim, can you imagine if I was like, Jim, you, why don't, you, why don't you think about doing less shows? Why don't you be... sleep in a little yeah. bit, Jimmy? <laughs> yeah. You, know, you don't have to do this. I mean, you have your, you're on the road a lot. Why, why you don't have to do this? <laughs> no, he tries to get me in other ways, though. He'll be like, Jim, you don't need condoms. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's pretty slick. <laughs> yeah, he's trying admit. to slowly kill me. And uh, I didn't really, dude, I, I mean, I, I knew about you, but I, I didn't know that you started that format. Like, it, it's really amazing the watching this. Zoo. It, it's such a good documentary. Thank you. No one knows that Scott. You got to tell him. Yeah, you got to be on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> you can <laughs> handle that. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows that Scott started Z100. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. I, I got to do a lot of commercials for Z100 over the years, and you just think Z100 always is. Right. Yeah. It was. Yeah. And then you see a moment in the film with Gavin DeGraw where he said, he thought he's, we're doing a Scott doc. And I go, no, dude, we're doing a, a, a doc about Z100. He said, Scott started Z100? I go, yeah, dude, and you're in the movie. Let me tell you, let me tell you a funny story. That just reminded me of this weird story. Um, when we were, uh, the, I worked for like four or five different uh, owners over at WPLJ here in New York. And uh, new people come in, and new people come in, and I was the program director, and, 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 and you know I had enough experience. I've been a program director since the seventies, for God's sakes. I should know at least what I'm doing. So I had these two brothers uh, who bought. Their dad started this company called Cumulus, mm -hmm. oh. and uh, their dad was very successful. But it was a media market, you know, smaller towns. Uh, in radio stations, but they, they took over and they bought the old ABC chain, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. And these two kids, you know, like Harvard and Stanford and business school and all that kind of thing. So, and these two guys really thought they knew what they were doing. Well, they were good in the smaller markets and the medium markets, but they came into these big city situations and they thought, well, we get, we'll take care of this. And so, uh, one of the first things they did was, uh, take away my job as program director. They anyway, brought this young kid in from uh, some town in uh, like Pueblo, Colorado or something, and he's going to be my boss. So I'm, you know, I don't mind. I'd get off early and go play golf and just do the morning show. And I went in to say, to say hello to him. And I'm talking to him. And I said, where'd you learn, to, you know, how'd you learn radio? Said, well, I grew up in uh, New Jersey and I listened to Z100. <laughs> I said, really? I said, really? And he's talking. We're talking about it. And then, he, I, uh, then I went to work at a, a subway store. Right? That, yeah. He sandwich. wasn't. A, he didn't start in a radio. He didn't start in radio. He started subway. <laughs> so he said, good too. And Scott, I was so good at it. <laughs> 
that they promoted me to manager in Poughkeepsie. Oh, <laughs> wow. He, ma- he was sent to Poughkeepsie to manage. He's no longer just going to make the freaking sandwiches. He's going to run the place. Wow. Right? Clearly so, a savant. Yeah. So, so he's in there. He says, it just so happened that the radio station, local radio station, K104, would come in and I'd make their sandwiches there. And I said, really? And they said, yeah. I asked him if I could come by and look at the station. And I loved that. I looked and I saw this is for me. I should be doing this right here. So he would hang around, hang around more. And he got to be, he got to work there. They wouldn't let him talk. He just ran the board. After all, he's at Subway. So so he gets, he finally gets a job at K104. And then from there he went to Colorado. And then he went to Z1. I mean, he went to PLJ. So he's telling me the whole boring story, and I go like this. Did you know, I I realize it, I don't think he knows that I worked there. I said, did you know I worked there? He goes, you worked at Z100? <laughs> and this is my boss. Yeah. <laughs> so I go home, I tell my wife, you know, it might be time for me to get the hell out of this business. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually, uh, the, the station shut down, they went out of business. Yeah. And yeah. Just, after you took care of that. <laughs> I did. You know what? I tell you what my favorite part of the documentary was. And it made me feel better about everything. Because, you know, it's like you shit on people on the radio. Right. And then you forget that they're actual human beings. <laughs> yeah. just you forget to do about thing. it. Yeah. But I saw you on Z100 shitting on Everyone. I mean, he had like the list of stations just talking about how lousy every single person was. And I was like, so he's got no grounds. And he called him out by name. Yeah. By name. Which people didn't do back then. They, they, that was kind of an unheard of thing to really reference them personally and to admit when you guys weren't doing well, you were like, we suck, which nobody was right. saying yeah. at yeah. that time. Yeah. Well, it was funny because one of our targets uh, was the, of the competition at the time what we had NBC where Howard was doing afternoons doing great and uh, WPLJ right before we put Z100 on the air here in New York uh, PLJ tried to you know advance in, in you know what do they call it when you flank us or whatever yeah. and they started playing Michael Jackson but they'd been a rock station a really great rock station for so long and all of a sudden they're playing Michael Jackson and all the latest top 40 they're Duran Duran and all this stuff you know and uh, so when I got on the air I said you know one of the reasons I came here i thought i was excited because i could listen to plj one of the great rock stations and all of a sudden the idiots are playing top 40 music and it's plj i went you know uh it's all of a sudden turned wimpy which was a big word right there i said so i rebranded it the wimp (laughs) w-i-m-p i said i think they changed their call letters to w-i-m-p and uh on the program director you might remember larry Berger. i didn't know larry Berger. didn't know him um um, but he was the uh, head of the thing. I can't. He's now gone. So I'm going to be kind. Yeah. So we changed his name to Larry Booger. <laughs> and and we and we would have a we had a stunt guy. Hey, it's a little Larry Booger. I'm over here at WIMP. And here's the new one by Debbie Boone. You know, that kind of crap. So one of my record buddies, uh, one of the promotion guys said he took uh, Larry to dinner one night. And he went into the, he had to pick up his laundry at this Chinese laundry in the city on the east side where he lived. And he goes in there and he said, I need to pick up my laundry. Who are you? He said, Larry, uh, Larry Booger. He says, you mean like Larry Booger? <laughs> he, said, he said, Larry Burger. He said, Larry Burger. And he said, no, I'm not Larry Burger. I'm Larry Burger, not Booger. So, uh, and uh, I never got to meet him, but. We made life pretty rough on him. Yeah. You also, by the way, you know, I one of my, I, I have this, I, I've read your bio, I have everything, oh, but of course it's the picture of you and Kiss. I'm very fiercely jealous because <laughs> that's like the Destroyer tour uh, costume. There's nothing I would like in life more. And you gave me a great photo, yeah. a beautiful photo, which I have in my apartment of, of the first picture ever taken of Kiss. I framed it too. Yes, you did. And you wrote a nice note, which I have. Um, and did you uh, have anything to do with Beth? Is that, I've heard that. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you explain yeah. that? Cause I, I've never uh, heard you tell it. I got fired from a job in Atlanta, Georgia. And, uh, and it was, we, we I took him to number one, well, tied for number one. And, um, the guy, the general manager didn't care for me. So he fired me and, uh, I was pissed off. So I was going to, I'm going to punish the radio business. I'm going to leave. 
<laughs> now, you talk about a stupid idea. <laughs> I'm so pissed I'm going to stop doing what I do. <laughs> so I, I love music. So I went to work at Casablanca Records in Los Angeles as a director of promotion and uh, A&R. And I got to know the the one of the the owner the the guy who ran it guy named uh, great broadcaster named Neil Bogart great record guy and uh, he said here's your job I want you to get Kiss played on top forty radio because then no they weren't hip enough for rock stations to play them right it was these guys that dressed up and they weren't you know shouting out loud and all that kind of thing they're not going to play them on a top forty station. Right. So then they work on Destroyer. I think Bob Ezrin was the producer. Yeah. And, and and Neil called me and says, would you listen to this and tell us what's going to be the top 40 song? And, it, it, and you know, I've listened to, you know, what they have. Uh, they had that Detroit Rock City was yeah. on there. And I forget all the other songs, but shout it out loud, yeah, flaming youth. Oh, yeah. you remember? Sweet right. pain. <laughs> Do you a, love me? What a groupie. <laughs> King of the nighttime world. <laughs> Jim, are you a fan of Kiss? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it became clear to me as a documentarian. <laughs> uh, you might even be one of those ones that wound up in bed with Gene Simmons. I don't know. <laughs> but, you so, wish. So I told her, I said, the only song on there that you could possibly, you know, uh, work with the, the top 40 would be Beth. And he says, oh, crap, we can't put that out. I said, what do you mean? You said you want to be on the top 40 stations. I'm telling you how to do it. You put Beth out. And he says, well, first of all, asshole, he <laughs> said, I'm involved in a, in, a, in a terrible divorce with my wife, and her name is Beth. <laughs> and I said, second of all, Gene Simmons, we're a rock and roll band. We're not putting that out. Third of all, they hate the drummer who wrote it and sang it. Oh, wow. Peter Chris." So, and they put out Detroit Rock City as the original song. And because um, uh, uh, this lady who was a big uh, programmer in uh, Detroit on CKLW, which was basically in Canada, but who cares? And, uh, and, she, and she's going to play that song and everybody's going to follow her playing that song. I said, well, well the people are going to follow. They're not in Detroit, Neil. They don't, well, they're not going to like it quite as much. So... And they did. I just left it alone. I said, well, do me a favor. When you do the 45, just put Beth on the B side. It's a yep. throwaway anyway. So I waited a couple of weeks and the the song didn't do well in Detroit. They uh, They dropped the rotation on it. So I took Beth and I sent it out to some of my friends that I knew from radio. And I put the X on that side instead of the other side, so they play that, and 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 all of a sudden it became number one request in these three little test markets that I used, and then I got it played in Boston, and all of a sudden it takes off, turns out to be the biggest hit they ever had. Yeah, and still pissed um, Gene Simmons off. <laughs> so what they did when they because they had to sing it in concert. You ever see him? Oh yes. You know what? They, <laughs> <laughs> I had a funny feeling you've been to one of their shows. <laughs> So what they what they do is because they did not like Peter Chris who wrote it and sang it. So what they did was they would all leave the stage and they play the track and he would sit on a stool. Wow, does this sound familiar? <laughs> yes, he would sit. He would just sit there and he would hand out roses as he sang yeah. it. Yeah, but that wasn't a stylistic choice. That was because they hated him. Right. Wow, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, they didn't. Well, they didn't write it. You know, yeah. you, you got two singers in the group, and, and he wasn't one of them. Yeah. He was the drummer. They just it, it did it. So that's how that came about. But the, the picture that you have was the first picture ever taken of the group in their outfits. Now, if you looked at it, I'm sure you peeked at it. A oh, yeah, times. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've done more than that looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep, that's an accurate hand movement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, but that picture that you have, you, you notice the, the, the uniforms are crude. The outfits yes. are completely different. Like homemade almost. Yeah, they were homemade, as a matter of fact. So. Yeah. Yeah, and a nice note from Scott. I love that. I had, it, it's at the bottom of the, the picture. I keep it I, I, out in the frame as well. It's really nice. You I never you never wrote a nice note to me. Well, I, well, I, you did the boat movie. That's true. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. Yes. That's a good point. But if you do want to write a note to him, assholes with two S's. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing about it is is the fact that um, that I do a morning show here in New York on, an, on CBS FM. Is that 101.1? That's 101.1. And Jim 
back in the day before he became a professional radio entertainer, <laughs> mm-hmm. he would come by and grace us with his presence. And that's how I got to know him. Yeah, I love it. It was a fun show to do, too. It was like, uh, you know, some guys interview comedians weird. And with you, it was just a hang. It was just a fun yeah, hang. Yeah, that's that's... What we, it's not like going to Indianapolis where, you know, Bob and Tom put you on there. You ever been there? I've done their show live once, yeah. No, nice guys. Uh, yeah. One of them's retired, but they call, still call it the Bob and Tom show. In radio now, if you have a popular show... Mm-hmm. And something happens to you, you retire or you die, they keep your name now. At what point so in life weird. did you realize, too, I'm listening to you talk, and it's like, you know, we both, Sam and I have shit radio voices, like, <laughs> your voice, but it's incredible. And I'm like, at what point in life do you realize, like, this voice is, is really something different than what most people have? When I was a kid, I knew right away that I was going to be in radio. I mean, I, I love music first. When I discovered rock and roll, I said, what, I, what, this, what the hell is this? I didn't know. Because I grew up in a pretty strict home, and you know, and by the time I'm like 11 or 12, I'm, an, I'm a, just a dud. I'm a <laughs> dumbass. <laughs> Playing base, baseball and football. And I, didn't even, I didn't have a girlfriend until I left home. <laughs> so, I mean, so, it, it, and I found music because that was kind of, I'd lock myself up. I didn't live in the house with my family. I lived in the basement. I made a little room down there. I, stack, I would stack my dad's army footlockers up and make a room. And then I had my own top 10 list, and a, you know, I had a little make-believe radio station. And the, the funny part about it was I, read a, I bought a book. Not bought a book. I took it from the library on how to make your voice deeper. <laughs> my mother came in, and I'm laying on the bed, back like this, you know, looking up at the ceiling, and you're supposed to go, and you got to do that and breathe deeper and deeper and deeper. And my voice never changed. <laughs> you know? So I, I think it's just, uh, you know, I don't think I have a particularly uh, uh, listenable voice, but it's not terrible. No, no it's, it's really good. I mean, just listening it's better to better than ours. That's, which is really a very thin line to jump over. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's a really good voice. Yeah, well, you, you get that watching the doc. Like, there's so many radio people in the documentary that you hear their 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 speaking voices and the way they enunciate their words and the and the tenor and everything and you're like yeah i don't know what we're doing in this industry jim <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know like <laughs> well, like that's not what we sound like the thing about it is when you use that delivery and when i when i first started i would imitate a dj that i and there's a the, the actual mitchell covered this guy in the documentary that we're talking about <laughs> And, and and we found that he found a picture of this guy. I, they used to have this window so you could stop on the street where I grew up in Indianapolis and look at the radio station. You could see him work. So my mother would go shopping on Saturday and I'd say, just drop me off over there. I'm going to go. I stood there like an idiot. Hey, what's he doing in there? You know, just watching the DJ work. And I said, man, that looks pretty good. That's the one. He's got music, he's got records, he's got the on the radio, he's got headphones, everything. And then you'd see him work the phones. So one he came out to see me one day. I'm saying, What are you doing? I said, He said, You come here every Saturday? I said, Yeah. I'm trying to get the hang of it, you know what I'm saying? And uh it it, it and then he said, Well, I like it because the girls come by and I get the numbers. Well, there's another pot. Another there. selling point, <laughs> another yeah. Another selling point. And, and, and I, you know, I, I started out imitating this disc jockey who happened to be what we call in the business a puker. Hi, everybody. It's, it's Jay Reynolds here at WIFA. So I would go on the air when my first job. I told, well, they said, well, you got a, uh, a tape. I, you know, I had to leave in a hurry. I didn't bring my tape, but I got a lot of experience. He <laughs> Really, do you? I hadn't been anywhere. The closest I got to a radio station was looking through that freaking window. So I go, when I get on, I go, Hi, everybody. It's Mike Shannon here on the WFLB, Spring Lake, North Carolina. And 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 then as I got a little bit more, I said, well, this sucks. <laughs> I'm going nowhere with this. So finally, I just started. I it became the fastest mouth in the South. I changed my name from Shannon to Super Shan. I thought that'd be a good nickname. Yeah. 
Try that today. Yeah. If this doesn't work out, you can have that. <laughs> Jim, you can be that. So anyway, that, that's how it got started. But I actually was a, a puker to begin with. How, but how long into it do you, when you're doing that, do you go, this is not enough. I don't want to just play records. I want to say what I want to say. I want to have fun on the air. Like, at what point does it become more than just playing records? When I got to be, a, 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 for, a, for a while, you know, I worked for different program directors, and most of them were idiots. Not all of them, but most of them yeah. were just idiots. And I knew more about, I studied it. I mean, I, I studied every market and every disc jockey that was famous. And well, you didn't have the internet there, but there was Billboard magazine and all that kind of thing. And I just, I got tired of working for a-holes. <laughs> and uh, so what I did was a, this a job came up at where I was working. The guy was leaving. I said, I told the boss, you know, I could, I could do this. I'd be the program director. He said, well, you're the DJ. I said, I know, but you can do both. I'll do both for you, and you don't have to pay me any more money. Smart. That's how smart I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were gut. Okay. <laughs> I re- I re- deal. There was one time. There was, there was one time I got I got a job, and uh, I'm sitting there, and inter- the guy's got that. Little, remember those metal desks with the little nice formica top on them? And I'm sitting there, and it's, it's a blue metal desk i'll never forget it and uh, uh and i was gonna move from uh mobile to memphis and the guy sitting behind this uh, the, the the desk he goes well uh how much you need to make i said well whatever you got i you know i don't care i just want to be a dj you know yeah well how about uh, how about 17 grand a year i go what's wrong i said I'm trying to figure out how much that is. <laughs> I only know about, I only know about a week. <laughs> how much is that a week? <laughs> I didn't know if I was getting a raise or not. Um, I, I think one of the most fascinating things about the doc is also like watching you create the morning zoo format. Just because that's another thing. Like as much as Z100 has always been, like for me, the morning zoo format is like one of the staples of radio now like to the point where not only like you said is the z100 morning show still to this day yeah called the z morning zoo but there's a morning zoo in literally every market i went to syracuse yeah and they're i don't even know if you know that like wjpz is the channel it's like the college why do you have station to go there, there? <laughs> what happened <laughs> <laughs> it's the only place that would let me in <laughs> um but wjpz is designed to be a direct, and they say, we're just copying Z100. Yeah. That's how we teach kids now. We just copy Z100, yeah. and that's how that's how kids are taught. Uh, number one, how do you feel about the way the format has kind of continued? And number two, don't you think you should be able to patent that? Because I was also thinking, you're not getting any of the money from the fact that everybody is stealing Sam, your format. Sam, just a minute. I came up here to talk to Jim and just have fun. <laughs> Don't, what do you? This is like sixty fucking sixty minutes. <laughs> Real love. Scott, let me ask you a question. Where do you think? Of, I got that. I talked to a guy yesterday on uh, the talk station in Atlanta. Where do you think radio's going, Scott? I don't. How the hell do I know? <laughs> I'm lucky to be still working in it. It, it is. It is. Uh, but you do recognize how influential you've been. Like you really, you change everything. Like it's. It's. Well, Really it would drive me crazy if I created a format. Sure. And everybody copied it. And either they sucked or I didn't get any money for it. Well, that would drive that, me crazy. Now, once again, remember I told you I was a dumbass when I started. <laughs> and it got worse. Like, because when we did the morning zoo, it was actually in Tampa when we started it. And I had a a, a friend of mine. A, he's now a friend. But at the time, he was the morning guy. And they <clears throat> they hired me. The way I got to do mornings was kind of funny because I was working in... Um, in uh, Washington, D.C., for an absolute moron. <laughs> I was the program director, but this guy didn't think I was good enough to be on the radio. He wouldn't let me on the radio. He didn't think I was a good disc jockey. His, uh, his college roommate owned the station, who happened to be Mr. Marriott from the Marriott uh, Hotel Organization. Wow. So <clears throat> he said... Can you give me a job? I don't have a job. He said, well, I'll let you run the station in D.C. You, you can do that. Oh, yeah, I can do that. No problem. So <laughs> they fired me, and I had just met this girl that I kind of liked. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, all of a sudden, I got to move. Because when you're the program director, 
you can't, you don't, nobody in town knows you. Mm. But when you're the morning DJ, aha, uh-huh. when they fire, you know what you do? You go across the street and mm. kick the holy crap out of them. So I figured out I was, you know, an afternoon DJ, maybe a night DJ, whatever. So I said, I want to be a morning DJ. So I had several different job offers at that point. I had a pretty good reputation as a programmer, but I wanted to be, I had to learn how to be a morning guy. So this uh, station in Tampa had been through some difficult times. They had some competition and they went from second to 18th or whatever. And they said, will you come and fix the station? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. But you got to let me do the morning show. The guy said, you never did the morning show. I said, well, I'm going to do one for you (laughs) or I won't fix your station. Okay. He went, okay, vote of confidence, right? (laughs) Well, okay, if you want to want to blackmail me. (laughs) And so I uh, and I met with the guy who was already there was a pretty good morning guy. And he did some comedy voices, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I sat him down and said, I want to do kind of a new show. He thought I was going to fire him and do, take over his job. I said, I need somebody to teach me how to do a morning <laughs> show. You can't go anywhere. <laughs> and uh, and we talked, and I and I had a notepad, and we spent. I think we had a, a we had a bottle of Canadian Club, and um, I was at the Tampa Ho- Tampa Hotel at the airport. There's a hotel at the airport in Tampa, and we just sat there. And uh, we ordered lunch up. We spent like five hours, and I basically laid out what I wanted to do. I wanted to, and I kind of made it up as I went. There was a a radio show out of Chicago my dad used to listen to called The Breakfast Club. Some guy named Don McNeil. And he had guests on the show. He had a band who would play the music, you know, and uh, it was syndicated all across the country. And I kind of, I just, you felt like you were having breakfast with this guy or you were in his family because they all he had like three or four different people this guy did this this guy did that and uh and i thought about that in saturday night live where they do the skits and all that and i kind of put the two together i welded them together and um and heavy listener participation you know there's several elements but we put them all down there and then we needed a name and you know he has all kinds of there's this it's called the zoo and Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Wheeler, who was going to be my partner, he goes, all right, I'm good with that, <laughs> and, you know. Right. And he was a big part of it. And the guy had a lot of talent. He did voices, and he wrote well. And uh, within six months of signing on, we were the number one rated morning show in the whole country. Wow. And, and we had jingle, morning zoo jingles and all that. Because at that time, Sam... Everybody had gone backwards. They, you know, they had a couple of shows like that around the country, but uh, basically, top forty radio had gone back to a single guy with a news chick over here, you know, and that was it. There yeah. was no fun. What mistake do you think they've made any mistakes? Because it seems like with satellite and podcast, there's so many other ways now. Do you think radio, regular radio, has made any mistakes that they could have avoided? Oh yeah. Well, that th- you can thank Bill Clinton for that when he deregulated radio. It used to be, you know, you could only have one owner, one or two stations, a market. Mm-hmm. And then when they he passed the law, this isn't going to change radio. Bullshit. It changed radio completely because then hedge funds and big companies went to these mom and pop stations and bought them. And now they've got clusters. You know, you look at uh, iHeartRadio here in New York. They got like six or seven radio stations and they run them all. And what happens, they paid so much money for these stations that they have to run more commercials. And that's where Sirius XM came in. Right. You know, you, you, it used to be we only ran eight, nine minutes an hour. Now it's 15, 14, like that. Yeah. I, I never it would have even occurred. I, I knew that when uh, when Bush was president and they, they I think they tenfolded the fines. It was 3,500 to 35,000 right, per yeah. FCC offense. But I never even thought about that uh, deregulated. Yeah, I guess that's what started the whole thing. Yeah. Right? And the Be- fact that you would- over commercials. Yeah. You know, and that, all the commercials and and pretty soon they they just wanted to cut it to the bone. A lot of stations got, you know, now you got automation. You got some stations like in a town like, let's just say, Peoria, Illinois. You won't find maybe one or two live DJs in the whole broadcast community there. Yeah. Right. How did you end up leaving Z100? Uh, I got a, I got, I, when I, 
That's a hard question. You, you're the you're the only guy that's asking the hard questions. I like talking to Jim. Yeah, what <laughs> I gotta think. <laughs> well, uh, what happened was when when I when I when I do radio, I always last two or three uh, years because I like to go and create and build and then move on. Yeah, mm. I, I just get bored easily, and. Uh, We'd already done Z100, and I had a, a a guy who was working with me then, a guy named Steve Kingston, who used to work at, uh, didn't he work at K-Rock, right? XM? Yeah, he worked at K-Rock, yeah. worked with Howard for a while. But anyway, he could, he was, you know, him and I were pretty close, and he could run things. And I said, you know what? Uh, my work is done here. And this guy was building a new station out in California, and he wanted, um, and he and he overpaid for it and so he was up against the wall so i uh, he gave he made me an offer just kept up more money more money more money it's the only time i ever did anything for money and it obviously it didn't work out too well because i'm back in new york <laughs> <laughs> but i lasted two years and uh, I, you know i made great money but that's just you know anybody that sits around and you make life decisions based on money, it usually doesn't work out. What time do you go to bed? Because morning radio is mm. such a rough. I, I was never able to get on that pure morning guy sta- uh, schedule. Jim, let me give you one tip. When you're talking to morning people, don't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> because when I go to like somebody's house for dinner or something like that, or you go to a party or whatever. You know, the, here's three things. Hey, what time you go to bed? Yeah, by yourself. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Yep. That's by one. Yourself. That's yep. one. And the next one is, well, what time you go to sleep? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the third one is, does it ever get old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then comes and then, then comes number four. How much longer are you going to do this? <laughs> well, I, I, here's why. Which I is asked. hilarious because you've been doing morning radio for so long. I'm sure every day people ask. And they do, yeah. but for me, it's like my schedule. We did six to ten, then six to eleven at one point, but now we're eight to eleven, which is more manageable. But I go out and I do a, a set at the club. I'm home by nine o'clock, but I can't fall asleep. Like I, I just I can't fall asleep till twelve or one a.m. And when I was doing six a.m., it was torture. I don't know how anybody ever adjusted their life to that. Well, if you're doing if you're doing a show like I do. It's a lot of preparation, and you really got to. What get is that? There. <laughs> you really got to get there. You really got to get there early. Oh, so you arrive early too? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I walk in this morning as the theme song started. I like to just walk in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, when you did that, nobody went. Oh, where's Jim? He's late. They're no, like, no, he'll, yes. he'll be here when the theme yes. song. Yes, and our product out. is a reflection of yeah. the lack of preparation. <laughs> Don't you worry, it'll be all right. Well, it just, it just, it. I think. You have to know more than the people who are listening about a lot of things. <laughs> so, dude, literally today, today, we were just having a conversation and we said, isn't it great that when you do radio, you could just say some shit and a lawyer or somebody will call up and tell you you're wrong and then it's fine. <laughs> so You don't have to tell them you're wrong. Yeah, they'll tell you. Like, it's a complete opposite you're philosophy. Like, like, you're just wrong you know, about sir, everything. Thank you for your call. I appreciate that. But we don't give a rat's ass. <laughs> Right or not, <laughs> and uh, there's a, a thing in the documentary too, which I had no idea about you that you had a uh, you were involved with the early part of Madonna's career, which I don't know if you yeah, meant the credit. You know, for. Uh, we might have blown that a little out of you know. <laughs> 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 you know what do they say? What do they say? They say, uh, well, you know, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 we were like a rage when it first started. The funny thing about it is we never said New York City weather. You know, the only thing we said was Z100 forecast or, you know, from the top of the Empire State Building. But we had no phones. People didn't know what it was because it wasn't WNBC. Right. It wasn't WABC. People never heard anything like this. We right. didn't play a bunch of commercials. We didn't go commercial free because WAPP tried that in the summer of what? Back a long time ago. And then they added commercials and everybody says, well, what the hell? Right. Oh, I thought you weren't com- I thought you weren't playing commercials. Well, we were for a while, <laughs> but now we got to. Yeah. And uh, it was just kind of weird because people, people would write us, what is this? What do you mean? What is this? <laughs> we finally, well, the problem was, we were in New Jersey, and there'd never been another successful radio property from New Jersey before. And a lot of people thought that was a jinx, because if you were in New Jersey, you know, especially Secaucus. Yeah. You know, it was not just New Jersey. It was 
It's the caucus. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what what happened was we couldn't run any contest or, or open the phone lines because there was never a radio station there that had any listeners. And they had to have that special phone that, that all the radio stations have special phones. Right. Because you can knock out that entire, you know, part of the city. In, or, or all of Sea Caucus, if people call and it knocks out the phones. Right. So we had to get a, a whatever they call it. We had to actually hook up some kind of microwave from Sea Caucus into a New York line because they had contest lines. The phone company had contest lines that we wouldn't blow up uh, the entire, you know, not the metropolitan. It doesn't do the whole thing. It's in sections. Right, right, right. And so when they first started calling, people said, where are you? <laughs> Hello, Z100. Yeah. You know, what is this? <laughs> it was just different because we, you know, we had one stop set, one commercial break, and uh, and we just talked to people and all the other stations were, hey, everybody, WPLJ, you know, and we were just talking to people. From the top of the Empire State Building, it was so brilliant, too. What a brilliant uh, way to Carney sell line. it. Carney line. Yeah. Like, total, the, the most I, Carney thing ever. I remember we had a, we had a guy... Uh, we had uh, our boss, the guy who ran it in uh, Cleveland, thought we needed an ad agency. I said, well, I don't know. Why, why are you going to waste your money? We can do this ourselves. And he said, no, we got to get an ad agency. All the stations have ad agencies. <laughs> so we met with the, this big time, great ad agency. I will not tell you the name because he's still around. And, um, and the, the we're got a whole table full of guys. I got a T-shirt on. I'm hungover. I got shorts on in the middle of this fancy Manhattan place. He said, you know what? I don't know if this is going to work or not uh, under your current uh, marketing program. I, well, what's wrong? He says, well, friends, you say you're from the Empire State Building. Everybody's on the Empire State Building. And I go, yeah, but nobody says they are. <laughs> he says, well, they can. I said, but they're not, idiot. <laughs> and uh, so finally, finally I, I called uh, Mr. Maltz out in the hall. And I said, we'll be right back. Hold on a minute. All right, I said, Mr. Maltz, I'm going to go ahead and leave. He said, what do you mean? These, these guys are idiots. They don't understand radio. He said, well, I gave them a deposit of 10 grand. I said, let them have it. Let's go. <laughs> and sure enough, you know what he said? He went back inside. This isn't for us. Thanks, guys. And we left. Wow. We Smart. Never, never and that was from it. coming from Tampa to New York, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I, that was, no, I was here already. We, oh, okay. we were on the air at that time. And it was just weird because we did the campaign ourselves. At, and uh, one of the guys in the in the movie, who was our sales manager, said in, in the in the documentary, says, Michael Ellis. No, it wasn't by the, I said the sales manager, Gary Fisher. Gary Fisher. How long were you working on that movie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of blanking on it. He's our director, by the way. <laughs> and anyway, it's in my rearview mirror until and this the, weekend. And the, and the thing about it was, he, he made a point, and I never thought of this. He says, we might have had the first viral campaign in the history of radio. You know, really? Because everybody, just all word of mouth. You know, there's some commercials in that movie, but we were already on air two years when we started TV commercials. I feel like your marketing strategy is similar to your strategy of like being the program director as well. It seems like a lot of your steps are like, I'll do it for free. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it, it, it was kind of funny when they, when they, I wasn't sure I wanted to leave Tampa and, and they flew me into, uh, into Cleveland. And then it's all in the movie to yeah. see what happened. And uh, I don't want to repeat that, but um, they, I went ahead and said, okay. Because basically all these old guys were smoking cigarettes and, and I was hung over and I had my eyes were all red and I'm sitting there. I got a tie on. I hate wearing a tie. I had it loosened up and I'm sweating and this collar is all messed up on my, you know. So finally I said, you know, I got to get out of here. You guys, thank you for having me. And the, I walked out to the elevator and the guy, the owner, went, oh, 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 where are you going? I said, I don't like cigarette smoke. I'm going home. <laughs> and he said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're our guy. You, 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 you're the guy. I said, Oh, okay. Well, that's easy. Why don't we do that in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we took uh, we. I went down there with the station manager down. There's a bar downstairs, and I needed a drink by that time. And there's a bar and a little restaurant down there. And we sat there and we worked out the details. And we turned over 
the placemat because I wanted to, he said, I got to catch a plane. I got to get out. I got to go back on the air tomorrow morning in Tampa. So he wrote out the contract on the back of the placemat. And he said, sign here. Okay. I get on the plane. I go like this, what the, what did I just do? I'm going home. I was like, what the hell happened? It's like, you know, you know when you, you ever watch Law & Order when they beat the kid up till he tells you, yeah, I did yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's basically what happened to me. I go like, well, I don't, I don't know what the hell to do in New York. I never lived there. Well, I've been a couple, I had been there a couple of times, but I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> yeah. How did, for somebody that was so comfortable, whether it was leaving meetings or like leaving a station after a yeah. couple of years or this or that. How much money was WPLJ giving you that they kept you there for as long as you were there? That PLJ? Yeah. I mean, you were there. You were PLJ forever. Is that 20 at, years, the, yeah. right? at that 20. point in your life, did you just get I, tired of leaving? Or? I got tired of leaving. Well, by that time, I was married and had a, a baby. Mm. And that kind of that kind of changed everything. You know? yeah. But you enjoyed that, I'm sure, for a while. I'm sure you had fun there oh, for a I while. Had, I had fun for a while. And the, the problem was there's nowhere else to go. Right, right, and right. Uh, and you know, I was you know, it was an unhappy time. I mean, you know, I worked with a guy who was hilarious, very, very funny, and uh, you know, there's some drawbacks of that, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, I just, I was pretty, I was pretty happy working there. The people I worked for were great, you know, it was wonderful. How long into it did you go? Like, uh, eh, maybe this is not what I thought. Like was there was there a point where you're like nah. yeah yeah but the day the day that I just had enough and I just went you know what because they wanted me they wanted to do a farewell and a Scott Shannon week and all this and I finally just said you know what I'll tell you what I'm gonna do tomorrow morning at about eight o'clock I'm gonna tell everybody I'm leaving and I said I'm retiring from PLJ <laughs> yeah. I I'm retiring from PLJ. Right. That was yeah. it. Hang my jersey up. I'm done here. Right. How good <laughs> That's good, Sam. <laughs> how good how good did it feel to move on oh. and start a new the morning day, show and day, have it be successful? The day I walked out of that room, yeah. out of that control room, I felt so great. Yeah. I felt so wonderful. It was just so great to be out of there and do you love that the station tanked and that you did well on CBS? Well, that would be horrible to say. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I went back. For, I went back for the uh, for the final day on the air. Oh, you did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I was to take a victory lap, though. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> dance around the flames. <laughs> what was who, who was it that uh, won a football game? They went out in the middle of, and they stomped on the logo. <laughs> Remember that? that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what that's like. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's easy. Game. It's easy to go back for the last day when you won. Yeah. <laughs> How long after did you leave PLJ before you were at your your job now? About two weeks. Oh, that, was, that was good luck. <laughs> I got <laughs> good luck. <laughs> the day the day I the day I retired from PLJ, I got my Trish, my wife. We got on a plane. We go right down to Florida, and I'm playing golf every day, and um, thinking about what I'm going to do. And and somebody says, uh, an agent called me. And says, Would you like to go back to work? I said, Call me next week. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take a little bit of time, relax. Yeah, I and mean, you know, I get uh, I get bored easily. So I was ready to go back to work, and and the people I work for now were very uh, welcoming, and uh, and I could put together a good team of people who were run off from the other place before, and uh, <clears throat> you know, put well, they what's the word? Uh, we're going to put the old team back together. Yeah, yeah. What did you do in the pandemic? We were all broadcasting from home. Did they build you something at home, or like how did they you? Didn't build that? me anything. I have I have a, a little studio at home, and uh, and we have one of those Comrex boxes. Everybody's got. Thank you, man. Get my gum. I I forgot. I do my show. I do my show chewing bubble gum. I don't think anybody does that. Yeah, it's, it's, I've tried. I do it. I love to chew gum. I used to smoke, but then I realized, oh, you can hear it. What do you do? Do you just uh, are you just aware not to chew loudly? I pack it away back here, and oh. then I start chewing when I close the mic. Is it is it valuable? Yeah. Put that in your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up in the top Sorry. left corner. <laughs> is it? Are you addicted to gum? Like I'm kind of addicted to eating and chewing and all that stuff. It's not shocking. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I usually I usually have a, a chunk in the morning. Just I don't know. It just 
keeps me moving kind of thing you know yeah. there's there's a you know there's a lot of one of the things about radio one of the things that howard used to say that i think is very accurate there's a lot of scumbags working in this business there are yeah yeah a lot of re- and it's not as bad as it used to be because they fired just about everybody there's hardly anybody doing live radio and but there's just so many people that you run into as i as i because i i paid my dues and i work Mobile, Columbus, Georgia, Memphis, Tennessee, Nashville, Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles. And, you know, that's not as many as a lot of people. Tampa. Tampa. Forgot Tampa. Yeah. Yeah. I'll throw them in there. Sorry. And (laughs) and, uh, it it was funny, too, because that show in Tampa that you talked about, Jim, was, was so different because we designed it to be for, you know, anytime in marketing. When you say you're going to market to everybody, that's a kiss of death. You can't do that. Of course. You have to target somebody. And how you get to a wide variety, how you go that way, is to a narrow target. And we did that. We designed a narrow target. It was like 25 to 35. And we served those people. But we didn't do that usual radio gaga and all that crap we we just entertained ourselves right and we found a lot of people like 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 you know opie and anthony used to do they had a bunch of wax out there like howard howard did the same thing whack pack and uh and, and and we just entertained ourselves and had fun and and it was it it worked and at that time when the ratings came out when they came after me for z100 we were number one teens number one 18 to 24 18 to 34 25 54 and 55 plus we're the only station in the country that had everybody yeah and and i don't you know i don't think you could do that again no it's really regular radio i I go on the road for gigs and there's very few markets that have great regular radio in the morning like there's some like a boston you have toucher and rich and uh mike calter's really funny in tampa he's good yeah and you'll get a bunch of guys but it's nothing like even it was 10 years ago it was Mm -hmm. there was much more to choose from than there is now yeah yeah Yeah. what was it who was doing that the other day something i was talking to oh who's the the, i gotta say it right Who's the little guy that's a stand-up comedian? Rich Voss. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean he's actually a small person. Oh, uh, Brad Williams. Brad Williams. Yeah, we had him on the other, and he he says he was going like, a, "Yeah, as a guy, I got to go around." I go, "Hey, what are you doing? Ring the bell, ring the bell, <laughs> hit the drum, hit the drum." He, he does a whole skit about when he goes around to promote his shows. He's he's really nice, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did uh, did Howard ever give you a hard time when you were opposing morning shows oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he uh and it, i think in his first book he said i hope he gets cancer and dies <laughs> <laughs> a couple of compliments like that <laughs> but you know you got oh he, he was especially hard on my wife you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah nasty but i mean you know, we got through it and uh, now we're you know i'm not gonna say friends but we speak how do oh. you do you take it personally when it's happening no, I did at first, but then I realized that he wouldn't have been messing with me if I wasn't successful. Right. And he doesn't he doesn't pick on the bottom guy on the on the on the ladder. Right. And the more personal he goes and the harder he goes, probably the bigger yeah, target yeah. you are. Look the, what he yeah. did to that guy in Philadelphia. Yeah. Debella, oh, right? Girl, Debella. <laughs> See, Debella tried to fight back. Right. That's where he screwed up. Right. I'll t- I'll show Howard Stern. I run Philadelphia. Oh yeah. Yeah, he lost everything. Yeah, he did. I think I did. John DeBell, I did his show once. I think he was, if I remember, it was very nice. But uh, he he stayed on in Philadelphia. Yeah, I he's think still the there. He's still yeah. on. Yeah, you never gave me the satisfaction of acknowledging the boat movie thing on the air. I would have loved it. <laughs> I think we did. We did eventually. <laughs> yeah. what, what Sam would do, he would take tapes from our our station, and I and I'm uh, I'm fairly famous in my world. We're not remembering names of movies or things like that. <laughs> you know, I saw that boat movie this weekend. And oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know where it was coming from at first. Somebody said, I go to a theater and say, Hey, how's the boat movie? <laughs> huh? What? what? Like a, a DA. What? what do you mean? Boat movie. Okay. Yeah. And someone said, You know, I'm open to Anthony talk about you all the time. They say you can watch it in a boat movie. Was it the Titanic? 
Was that the movie? <laughs> no, it was it was uh, it was the it was uh, Captain Phillips, I think. Yeah, that oh, was, I think it was. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a boat movie. It's the boat movie. Yeah, <laughs> that and the tree on my house. I got a tree on my house. <laughs> <laughs> I went in one day and there was a whole. Remember that storm that ever ripped all the trees? Yeah, I got a tree on my house today. So. so who thinks to isolate that and play it? <laughs> and everybody, and that's, like, that's like code word, you know. He's got a tree on his house. That's got to be Scott Shannon over there. <laughs> because it was so, like, because the beauty of it was, it wasn't that you said, I got a tree on my house. It's that the room didn't give you anything. Right. Uh, unfairly, right? Like, they were, but, like, they wouldn't give you anything. And it wasn't the fact that you said, I got a tree on my house. It was the fact that there was, like, one second of dead air right after it. <laughs> yeah, it's like you sound like a lunatic. Well, they weren't allowed to, they, unless Todd said it. They weren't allowed to laugh. Right. That's oh, it. And yeah. so, and so, anytime you would drop something, I'd be yeah. like, "Yes, give me more, give me more." Yeah. Well, it, I used to be funny before him, and I was funny after him. But during him, you're not allowed to be funny. <laughs> that was weird how that works. Huh? Very strange. Very strange. Did you guys uh, ever, like, uh, not that you hate each other, but did you ever, like, mend fences after that? I hate that I just said mend fences like a fuck it, like I'm my aunt. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think you got a future in this business. <laughs> yeah, did you mend fences? What a fucking asshole. You shouldn't answer that. Yeah, yeah you're one of these edgy comics. Now, right? here's, my, here's my favorite. What time do you go to bed? It really is. <laughs> I've asked two that, shit questions. Right that was a horrible question, but mending fences is in my yeah, that, guts. That's going to bother me for a month. Well, uh, I should mention, I should mention you can pre-order this whole goofy movie if you're interested. Worst of first, uh, the history of Z100. There's some good lessons in that movie. Our director accidentally put some real valuable stuff in there. <laughs> well, Mitchell, like, how did you fi how did you find this story and realize, like, oh yeah, I can make a movie out of this? Well, when I was first approached, oh, wait, we're actually going to talk about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. When I was first, well, he <laughs> talked about it before we got here. But Sam did talk about it. I did. I'm a professional. Thank you. Thank you, man. <laughs> What you know, time you? What time you go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> what time do you wake up? Um, How you doing? What do you got? So thank you. So Tell Sam, him. it was interesting that the story of Scott is so wide. You know, mm. The canvas is so wide. So when you first start looking to make a documentary, you shouldn't go into it knowing what the story is. You should do research and discover the story. And to tell the story of Z100 and to tell Scott's story and to tell a New York story, it came down to those 74 days. Because that's something that no one else ever experienced. That's a story that's unique to Scott that, and no one else. So to capture that moment and try to capture a little bit of the 80s and capture the sound and voice and how fast it went. That's why people talk about the editing in the movie. It's so fast. It had to be. Because for Scott, it went like... It was Cutting in between two people talking. Yeah, there really yeah, was. It was very, very well done. Was, thank you. It was done intentionally. Um to really have almost a Greek chorus. So it wasn't a matter of doing interviews. It was a matter of taking snippets from each person to complete a statement because they all then shared that moment of where they were in the 80s when, right. when he hit. And there was nothing like it. Um, I had knew nothing other than Scott's name, and he was the PLJ guy. And, and you know what? Leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> and, Leave it right there. And it was a big discovery you know, so much about his career was a discovery and it was, it became like the David or DeVita versus Goliath story, which, which I think still holds true today. It's like one person could change everything if they yeah. just don't give up and they're like Scott and they, or just, they don't give up yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they have thick skin and just don't quit. And that's you know what, what the movie was about. I'm, I'm spoiled because I know the microphone's okay here, mm -hmm. but I've been doing radio for so long normal radio that i still can't bring myself to say it the yeah, cursing yeah yeah, yeah, yeah you sure. i don't know why it's just you know what? it feels remember, good remember when you were a kid and you'd be out with your buddies yeah his mother, blah, blah, blah. and then the minute you go through the door at the house you turn the switch off. Turn it off. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, but it'd be great if we got you comfortable doing it here, and then on oh, yeah, tomorrow no, you show up to CBS with FCC yeah. violations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? Shannon's back over here in line to try to get a job. <laughs>